Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, NIST Updates Are Coming, So What's the Impact? I'm Kate Carson, Marketing Events Specialist at Tripwire, and I'm very excited to be a part of this webcast today. So before the presentation begins, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. First, make sure that your audio is streaming correctly. Please note that the audio portion will stream through your PC or laptop speakers. Be sure to check your speaker volume, the volume setting on your computer, and your headset to ensure that it's turned on and volume is at an audible level. Today's presentations will be using a slide deck. You can click on the expand rectangle on the top right corner of the slide area to enlarge. If you're not seeing the slide movement in your console, you can just try refreshing your browser and that should do the trick. If you're experiencing technical difficulty, please click on the help widget which is the question mark icon on your console, and it covers most common technical issues. If you have a question for our presenters today, click on the Q&A widget and submit your question. At the end of today's presentation, we will be doing a Q&A session. And feel free to use that Q&A widget to submit comments. Lastly, I'll be sending out a follow-up email with the link to the on-demand webcast and the slide deck. So now, let's get on with the presentation. I am honored to introduce our featured speaker today, Dr. Ron Ross. Ron Ross is a fellow at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST. His focus areas include information security, system security engineering, and risk management. Dr. Ross leads the FISMA implement implementation project, which includes the development of security standards and guidelines for the federal government, contractors, and the United States critical infrastructure. Dr. Ross also leads the Joint Task Force and Interagency par Partnership with the Department of Defense, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, U.S. Intelligence Community, and the Committee on National Security Systems with responsibility for the development of the Unified Information Security, security Framework for the federal government and its contractors. And there is more about Dr. Ross, so if you'd like to read more about him, including his current publications and awards, click on the bio widget at the bottom of your console. Our other great speaker today is David Meltzer. David is Chief Technology Officer at Tripwire, where he is responsible for working with customers, partners, and industry experts to imagine, innovate, and deliver on advancing the state of the art in protecting Tripwire's customers from the most sophisticated attackers in the world. David has been an entrepreneur, leader, software developer, security researcher, and generally obsessed with network security for the last two decades. You can also read more about David in the bio widget. Okay, so we've got a lot of ground to cover today. So now without further delay, I'm going to hand it over to David Meltzer. Take it away, David. Thanks, Kate. I'm very excited today to hear from Dr. Ross about some of the updates and revisions happening to uh, NIST documents. You know, we're going to talk today about SP 837 uh, and what's going on with that with revision 2. We're going to talk about SP 800.5.3 and talk about what's going on with that with revision 5. I was looking through some of the uh, attendee list and registrants for the webcast and it looks like we have three different groups here, um, government agencies and contractors. Um, who've been clearly familiar with these NIST publications and the risk management framework uh, for quite a while already and probably very interested to hear what's the latest breaking news about the changes happening in each one of these documents. Uh, also, government suppliers uh, who, uh, as a result of 800-171 and FAR and DFAR, um, are particularly interested in what the NIST 800 -53 guidance is and how that's going to be updated. Uh, and then uh, a surprisingly large number of commercial organizations who I've seen the greatest growth around interest in NIST guidance over the last year in looking at how they can be leveraging uh, NIST standards and guidance to help to construct, improve, and evolve their own security programs. So we're going to get a little bit of background of the publication, but really Dr. Ross is going to focus in here on what are the key changes, what are those changes going to mean to your agency, to your organization, uh, or to your company. Uh, and then we'll finish up by having a little bit of talking about what are some best practices on how you can actually use the guidance uh, and take advantage of these publications. And then we'll have a Q&A session. So with that as a brief introduction to the agenda, let me now turn it over to Dr. Ross uh, to get into the details. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, David, and, and thanks, Kate, for hosting the webinar today. 
Um, I'm, before I start, I just wanted to thank uh, Tripwire and uh, all of our industry partners out there. You know, cybersecurity problems and, and are, are really universal today. They transcend the federal government. They go through our state and local governments deep into the private sector. And this is clearly a national level problem that we have to solve together. And it's always heartening to me. You hear a lot of talk about public-private partnerships, but, you know, from the NIST perspective, you know, our job is to, to build and deploy the best security and privacy standards and guidelines we possibly can for our customers. But we've always considered our customer base to be very broad, not just the federal government. So we do our public reviews for all of our, our documents, and every one of those comments that you send in, whether you're on the public sector side or the private sector side, each one of those comments is considered carefully and thoughtfully, and we use that feedback to build better standards and guidelines for you. So thank you all for attending today, and, and it's great to see the broad base of customers who join the webinar. I want to start out by kind of framing the problem. We're going to talk about the two big document updates that are going on right now. They're kind of our flagship documents in some sense. The NIST 853 has been around since 2005. And of course, 837, the risk management framework has been around almost that long, maybe a little bit younger, but uh, a long time. There, there's clearly today, the scenario that we're looking at is Literally, we're pushing computers to the edge. And when I say that, I mean we're taking these wonderful computers loaded with firmware and software, highly capable machines, and we're putting them into everything we possibly can. They're going into things like dishwashers and refrigerators and automobiles and medical devices. And then there's the classic traditional things that we think about with information systems, mainframe computers, workstations, laptops, a whole generation of smartphones devices. So we, we are literally pushing these computers to the edge, and, and we're finding that the security and privacy controls that we've always known uh, that we needed for our traditional information systems like laptops and, and those kinds of things, workstations, we, we're now finding those controls have to move to the edge with those devices and with all of the things that are being characterized as the Internet of Things. And so these are really important documents, and there's a lot of things going on, too, that are um, running in the background that are driving these, these major updates. Uh, a lot of them are driven from the president's uh, cybersecurity executive order that um, President Trump signed a couple of months ago that makes the cybersecurity framework mandatory for the federal government. We'll talk about that when, when we talk about the 837 update. But there's clearly lots of things going on. The OMB policy... Um, M1725 came out shortly after the president signed the cybersecurity executive order, and that policy is really the implementation uh, for the federal agencies. How do the, how do the feds uh, comply with the executive order? And that policy talks about ways to do that. And in that policy update, uh, M1725, you will see two NIST publications referenced, 839, which is the enterprise-wide risk management guidance document, and 837, which is the risk management framework. So there is a lot of confusion out there about the when you when you hear the word framework, people think of two things now. They think of the cybersecurity framework, which was a project that NIST uh, was involved in about four years ago to work with the critical infrastructure, all of those sectors, to build a, a cybersecurity framework that would be. Uh, useful for them to help them protect their critical assets. And it's been a very successful project. The adoption has been fairly widespread. And, and now with the executive order, the federal government is making the same commitment. They're saying we're going to use that same framework to help us manage our cybersecurity uh, risks that we have within the federal government. But the, the, uh, also we have this, a similar issue we have uh, we have to comply with our FISMA responsibilities and, and requirements under the legislation that's still there. The Federal Information Security Management Act of 2002 was updated in 2014, now called the Federal Information Security Modernization Act, largely the same legislation that was there from 2002. And NIST has developed a whole suite of standards and guidelines that help our federal agencies comply with the legislation with operational type uh, documents like the controls document, the risk management framework, the assessment uh, guideline for assessment, assessing your controls, risk assessments, and the whole nine yards. So now we fast forward to the executive order and the OMB policy, and you're going to see now two major updates happening. One 
is with the 800-53, and that's revision five. And that uh, that revision now is out for its initial public review. Many of you might have already seen it. it came out August the 15th. It's only going to be out for a 30-day public comment period, so I would urge everybody out there to take a look at it. We've put a markup copy on our website so you can see the actual changes to the uh, security and privacy controls, and also you can see changes to the baselines that we've uh, uh, developed in this latest update. And so when that comment period closes, we are going to be taking all the public input and producing a final draft that should be out sometime in the October timeframe. And we have, we've actually selected the final publication date of December the 29th. So you can see these updates are moving rather quickly. And this is all in the context of what's coming out of the Office of American Innovation and the American Technology Council. There, there are uh, large projects underway now to look at modernizing the federal IT infrastructure. And very closely aligned with that modernization effort are going to be issues that are very close to security and privacy. Because as we modernize, we will be building security into those new systems as those systems are upgraded and modernized over time. And we also have still a very large problem with complexity. We, we have a very large and complex infrastructure. Millions of lines of code and operating systems and middleware and hundreds and thousands of applications. And that complexity is really working against us now with regard to the adversaries. They pretty much have a field day whenever they want to find a place where they can attack and, and uh, make an impact, a negative impact on a federal agency or one of our private sector partners. So we, we've got a lot of work going on in the world of system security engineering. Many of you might have seen our uh, special publication 80160 that we released uh, last November. That's the playbook on how to build security into the system development life cycle. So it basically addresses what do you do if you're a system engineer and you want to make sure that when that system is built, the requirements, the architecture, the design, all the way through the life cycle, the, those security capabilities are built in from day one. That's really in, uh, very, very important today with regard to uh, these kinds of efforts. We also have a project going on that deals with high value assets. Our colleagues at the Department of Homeland Security are collaborating with NIST to develop um, a set of controls for high value assets. This is an outgrowth of the OPM breach and figuring out where are high value assets and how can we go the extra mile to make sure those assets are well protected. So there's lots of things going on that are gonna be dependent on 800-53 and the 837 to, to really uh, do the heavy lift to make sure all these things can be accomplished. So I'm going to start with 853. I'll stay on the same slide, and, and I'll just focus on some of the key items that you're going to see you might have already seen in, in the current draft that's on our website. The first thing you'll probably notice is that in this publication, I call this the Next Generation Security and Privacy Control Guideline because We've tried to listen to our customers, and one of the things that the Fortune 500 CIOs told me is they said they, they love the controls in the catalog, they love the NIST guidance, but they think it's mostly targeted to federal agencies. And that's true, that's our primary customer base, but in order to make the document more welcoming to those folks who are in <clears throat> state and local governments and, and the private sector, which really is 90% of the, the world out there besides the federal government, we took the word federal out of the document in all the places that we possibly could. It's still there in a couple of places where we have to reference it with regard to FISMA, but for the most part, that, that term has been taken out. So people can look at it, it can be more welcoming, and people can feel they can use that in almost any situation, whether you're public or private sector. The next thing that we did, you'll notice the term information system is still in the document. It's even in the title. But you'll notice when you move through Chapter 1 going into Chapter 2 and into the actual control catalog, the word information is taken away from system, and we now just call things systems. And the reason we're doing this is because I talked earlier about pushing computers to the edge. We, we think of information systems, at least I do, in the classic sense of that workstation, that laptop, and things that are the, the, the traditional computing platforms that we've used for, for decades. But today, when you talk about computers and where they're headed to the edge, 
th those computers now are going to be in devices that we never anticipated. If you remember last fall, we had that, that ba bad attack uh, that was um, really targeting home devices like baby monitors and DVRs and cameras where the adversaries knew that those default passwords weren't being changed and they could actually co-opt those devices. So they developed an army of private consumers with those devices that they co-opted and they turned those around and launched some pretty serious attacks on individuals' websites and also two-thirds of the Internet came down. So we, we really have to pay attention and having security and privacy controls that can move to the edge with those devices and the software and the firmware that are going with those computers is really important. And again, it's not to say, you know, our control catalog has a lot of controls in it, over 800 now. And the, the thing we're going to talk about today is how you, picking the right controls is really the critical thing. Nobody is ever going to use all 800 controls, but knowing that you have the right controls to choose from that can do the job in any situation is pretty important. So the next thing that you're going to notice is that we took out some of the pictures that were in the front part of the document. We had a picture of the risk management framework, that six-step process. We had a picture of that pyramid that goes into 839, which talks about the enterprise risk management model, where you have the C-suite at the organization level one, you have mission business process at level two, and then at level three you have the information systems. We've separated process from controls, and the reason we did that is we wanted to make the controls in 853 consumable by large communities of interest that may go beyond the federal government. For example, the people in the federal agencies will use the risk management framework to do their control selection and go through the, all the steps that lead to the authorization process and into continuous monitoring. But let's say, for example, you're in the private sector and you're using the cybersecurity framework. And you're looking at that framework, the top-level functions like identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. And then you're looking at all those categories and subcategories that are part of the core of the cybersecurity framework. Once you get down to those subcategories, you now have five different choices for security controls. One of those choices is NIST 853, and there's four others. So we wanted to make sure that um, the folks who are using the cybersecurity framework, which includes the federal government now, would be able to take those controls and not be tied to a particular process or framework. And that's really, again, we're growing our customer base and trying to make these controls as useful and as effective as we can for the vast majority of our customers who may go beyond uh, the federal government. The next thing you'll see is that uh, if you've been looking at our controls since 2005, you know that every control in the past started out with one of two uh, starting points. Either the information system does X, Y, or Z. That's for controls that are more technical. They're in the hardware, the software, and the firmware. Or the other side of that could be the organization does A, B, C. That would be controls that are more management or operationally directed. And so we've taken off completely those two starting terms because I talked about the engineering guideline and how we want to, the, the controls to be used by not just the enterprise folks who use them all the time, but also systems engineers who are going to be building security capabilities into these systems that are going to be coming online in the future. So if you, know, if you ever work with engineers, you know they like to be told, uh, they don't like to be told how to do something. They want you to tell them, what do you want done, and we'll figure out the best way to do it. We'll engineer a solution that's going to be effective for you. And so now those controls are, are not going to be dictated toward the system or the organization side. The engineers are going to figure out the best place where those controls should be deployed. And again, it, it's, it's our first step toward making these controls more outcome-based. Now, I will admit the controls are not fully outcome-based yet, but you're going to see over time as we start to transition, the controls will become more outcome-based. So we focus on what are the kinds of solutions or the capabilities we want to see and not focus as much on every detail that we have to focus on to get there. The last big piece of 53Rev5 is the full integration of privacy. And uh, this integration of privacy, I, I think, was really groundbreaking. We were one of the first organizations to address privacy controls back in 2013 with Revision 4. And as many of you know, we had all the privacy controls in Appendix J in the back of the document. They were in eight different families. 
So as we were looking at doing our revision five, we, we sat down with our privacy team, and we also have a, a privacy engineering team. So we, we really have a lot of symmetry here with security engineering and privacy engineering and bringing these two worlds together. And we said, what would it take to bring all those privacy controls into a unified catalog? So our privacy and our security teams could work closely together, not separated by their flag of privacy or security, but working together to, to build the best security and privacy programs that we possibly could build. And so we looked at every control in those eight families, and those of you who have been looking at 853 since its start will know that we had 17 originally family, original families that are tied to FIPS Publication 200, the, the minimum security requirements. We added an 18th family, about a year or two after 2005, and that was our program management family. Those are controls that are deployed by the enterprise that are not really tethered to any particular system. And then we had the eight privacy controls, control families in the appendix. So we said of all those controls, they, we, we actually put those into the main catalog, and they went to one of three places. Two privacy controls actually survived, and now we have a total of 20 families in 853 Rev 5, 17 original security families, a program management family, and two privacy families. So some of the controls in those eight families went to those two privacy families. There was another big group of privacy controls that went to our PM family. Those are privacy controls that are deployed at the enterprise level, more or less as common controls for everybody to inherit um, if you're a system owner. And the third group of controls was very interesting. Some of the privacy controls that were left, if they didn't go into the two families or the PM family, we found that our security controls, interestingly enough, were, were able to handle both the privacy aspects and the security aspects in that one control. So in Rev 5, you're going to see a new class of controls called joint controls. These are security controls that have been renamed, and they're now joint controls. So, for example, we had a control in the awareness and training family, the AT family. I believe it's AT2. It's, it used to be security awareness training. We shortened the title to just awareness training, and we now use that as a joint control because we found that there's a requirement in an organization to build a security awareness program and do all the training related to security awareness. There's also a similar requirement for privacy, privacy awareness program and all the privacy training programs that have to be developed. So now we combine those into one control. We're doing things more efficiently, and at the same time, we're bringing together the privacy and security teams, and they can collaborate in, in areas that make the organization more efficient and more cost-effective. So we have an appendix in the Rev 5 that will show all the privacy community exactly what happened to every one of those controls, which ones are going to the, uh, the, the joint category, which ones are in the PM uh, family, and which ones are in the two privacy families. So this, I believe, is unprecedented um, in any control catalog in the world. Most control catalogs don't address privacy, and very few have brought these two worlds together so we can get better solutions. Those are really the big things that uh, came out of the Rev5 update. And um, I think what I'm going to do now is, is kind of transition into the uh, 837. And, and this is where I'm, I'm going to make some breaking news here today. Um, I'm characterizing the 837 Revision 2 as the RMF 2.0. And there's a lot going on in this publication. We, we are targeted to release this document on September the 5th. But I'm going to share some breaking news with you in, in a few minutes that will explain why that, that publication date may be delayed. In the 837, again, we, um, we're doing a lot of important things. The executive order <clears throat> requires NIST and the entire federal government, for that matter, to use the cybersecurity framework as our primary risk management vehicle. But those of you who are familiar <clears throat> with the cybersecurity framework know that uh, organizations, it doesn't come with a risk management framework or a risk management process that's embedded in that cybersecurity framework. You basically get to bring whichever risk management process or framework you choose to use. So in the federal government, we are going to be implementing the cybersecurity framework, but we're using our current risk management processes in 839 and the risk management framework in 837 to actually carry out the nitty-gritty day-to-day operations that really are down at the system level. 
So in some sense, it's the, it's the marrying up of two really uh, great worlds. The cybersecurity framework operates primarily, if you recall, in the 839, that pyramid I talked about where you've got the C-suite organization at, at level one, you've got the mission business process at level two, and you've got the system at level three. The cybersecurity framework is really, really good at describing things at the top two tiers, the, the C-suite level and the mission business process level. The NIST risk management framework is really good at operating at the system level where you have to actually do the control selection, implement those controls, make sure they're assessed for effectiveness, and then go to do some kind of an authorization or risk acceptance process, and then moving into continuous monitoring. So we have taken those concepts in the cybersecurity framework, and when you see RMF 2.0, 837.0, Rev2, you will see that those key concepts now have been integrated. So just as a, an example, the identify step, which is, is the first function of the cybersecurity framework and the core part of the framework, the identify part of the cybersecurity framework has all of the activities that are feeding into the uh, NIST risk management framework. So you can see on this slide, we've actually added a step to the risk management framework. It used to have six steps, now it has seven steps, but that new step is called the preparation step. It kind of sits in the middle of the RMF, and what's happening is it's taking uh, information from the cybersecurity framework identify step, and in that preparation step, when you, when you actually get a chance to look at the document, you will see there are about 12 different tasks in that preparation step. The purpose of that preparation step is to make sure that the C-suite is connected to the operational people at the system level. And you're going to see things in that organizational preparation step that are going to happen at the enterprise level before a system owner would go through the RMF process at that system or the operational level. So things like developing a risk management strategy, uh, making sure you have all of your roles and responsibilities for risk management and cybersecurity and privacy filled, making sure you describe the organization's missions and business functions up front, making sure that the stakeholders, their protection needs are defined and all the security and re privacy requirements for the organization are well defined before those things get pushed down into the system owner's world. And things like doing an asset valuation. You know, one of the things we've got going now is working with DHS on something called the High Value Asset Project. This is a requirement that came out of the OPM breach where we're now looking for all of our high value assets and we're going to be developing what we call overlays or pre-tailored baselines of security controls that will be required to be used for high value assets when you have one of those assets in the federal government. So the in the RMF uh, preparation step, that asset valuation where you look around the organization and say, of everything we have, which are the most critical things that we have to protect? And, and those, uh, the identification of those high value assets and things like that will allow us to focus more attention on the things that are really important and be a little more lax on the things that are lower impact according to FIPS 199. In that organizational preparation step, you're also going to see common control selection, identification and selection, making sure the enterprise maximizes the use of common controls. So every control you move to common space is one less control that a system owner has to worry about. And, and those can be inherited by all system owners downstream. And the last thing that we've added is something called an impact level prioritization. If you're in a federal agency, and you look at the distribution of your categorizations. We, in the federal government, this won't apply to our private sector colleagues, but in the federal government, every one of our systems is categorized either low, moderate, or high impact. And that's based on the kind of information that's being processed, stored, and transmitted, which is also categorized using that same FIPS 199 standard. Now, most organizations, when you look at the distribution of their systems, it looks kind of like a bell curve. 70% of federal systems or more are moderate. Moderate impact means that if you lose that system or it's breached and you lose the capability, there's a serious potential adverse impact on your operations. If you're on the low side, which represents maybe 5 or maybe 10 to 15%, I guess there would be maybe 15% that are low impact, minimal impact, low, limited adverse impact on your operations if that system gets compromised. Our high impact systems would be those that are 
if you have a breach on a high impact system, it is something that's severe or catastrophic. And maybe we have 15% of our systems, 5, 10, 15 on that side as well. But the important point is that the vast majority of these systems are moderate. So when you look at 70% of your systems, how do you distinguish one moderate system from another? So we have a new step in RMF 2.0 that allows an organization to do a triage on those systems. So if you have 70% of your systems are moderate, you can go through and tag those systems. These are the most important moderate ones. These are the least important ones. And then there's the bunch in the center. And that's going to help organizations move some of those systems to the cloud world, the public cloud that are out there under the FedRAMP program. It will help them move toward more aggressively to shared services. We, we have a, a large project with OMB now that they're pushing as many of these applications in federal systems to the cloud and to shared services so we can focus on the high-value assets that remain behind. This is a way to streamline and, and thin the herd, so to speak, because we just have too much complexity now. We have to be able to thin those things out to the point where we can focus on the things that are important. So that, that uh, is a big part of what's going on in 837. It's the addition of that organizational prep step. You're also going to see the, the systems engineering work that I talked about in Special Pub 800-160. That was a publication that we released last November. That's the playbook on how you build security into the life cycle. And that document can be used by industry or federal agencies as they're getting ready to procure a new system to make sure that whoever is building the system or components for that system understands that you can't add security on at the end of the process. It has to be engineered in from the start, which means the requirements engineering process has to go on, the architecture, the design of that system, the components, all the things that we care about that we've got for, from 40 years worth of best practices in developing trustworthy systems, all of those things are, are captured in Special Publication 800-160. We're actually referencing those engineering steps at the appropriate place where they would most likely appear in the risk management framework. So now if you're in an enterprise, you'll be able to see what part of the engineering process is being activated by this particular step in the RMF, and then you can take appropriate actions from that point. I guess the, the breaking news that I would like to talk about now is something just happened uh, a week ago. We uh, have been committed to bringing privacy into all of our FISMA-related publications. We started, obviously, with 853, and the game plan was to move privacy into the risk management framework as well, but we were going to hold that off to revision number three sometime in 2018. But we decided in, in consultation with OMB last week and, and just looking at the situation of 853, we, we now are going to be bringing privacy into the risk management framework in revision two. It's a, it's a bold step, and what it means is that when you use the risk management framework now to select your security controls and make sure they're implemented and you go through the assessment and all that part of the classic RMF, when you see the revision two of the RMF, now privacy officers, senior agency officials for privacy, can now use the same risk management framework to select their privacy controls from the controls that are listed in 853 Rev 5. And they'll be able to go through the exact same steps in the RMF, the select process, although the criteria for selecting controls will be different and articulated in the RMF 2.0. They're, 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 like we use our baselines and we have a tailoring process that security professionals go through when they, when they develop their security plans. Privacy professionals will do the same thing. They'll have their own criteria defined in the NIST, um, the NISTER that we have uh, on privacy engineering. That criteria will then be used by the privacy officials to select the appropriate privacy controls and you will see very much of a synergistic process the privacy plan will be constructed. Those controls will be implemented. There will be a privacy assessment. There will be control assessors that will assess privacy controls for effectiveness. They will go through the same process, and then all of that uh, assessment results, the findings, will be fed to the authorizing official. And you're going to also notice that it's not called a security authorization any longer. It's just called authorization. And the authorizing official has dual responsibilities now. 
there's a senior official for security and there's a senior official for privacy both feeding information to that authorization official who has to make the ultimate risk-based decision. And so, and then there's also continuous monitoring, which privacy is also, there's a, a privacy continuous monitoring component as well. So you can see that we're bringing the world of privacy very close to the world of security because they depend upon each other to be successful. And, and I don't think that there's any framework around that's doing the same thing. This is going to be huge for tool makers and people who are, have taken the classic RMF and are using it to, um, to help the control selection process for security, they will now be able to make some modifications and, and really open up a whole new world of people who care about privacy. So that, that's a lot of stuff going on in, in the 800-37 world. I'll just say in closing, uh, before um, we, we turn it over to, the, uh, to, to David, uh, the there's a lot of things going on here that um, relate to the authorization process as well, where you're going to find a lot of streamlining things in the second revision that deal with the classic authorization to operate process. We've introduced a new uh, process called authorization to use, and this is done for, for senior leaders who are not actually going through the ATO process, but they're using somebody else's system, maybe a shared service or a cloud service, that somebody else has already done an ATO on, and they're going to basically be able to tap in and, re and leverage that information and do a very quick and simple authorization to use, accepting whatever risk they have to accept based upon the use of that, uh, that shared service or that cloud service. The FedRAMP model is something very similar to that. So the, these, uh, the next slide on drivers for change, um, I, this just kind of summarizes a lot of the topics that I just covered. The, um, again, these are kind of the next generation security and privacy controls that can be used by almost anybody in any sector. I know on the call today we have people represented from the federal community, the private sector community, uh, national, international, and you know our job at NIST is to try to bring you the, the best vehicles, tools, techniques, processes, that we possibly can so you can be successful in helping to protect your organization both on the security side and the privacy side. Uh, the outcome-based controls, this is only the first step in 53. Uh, we, we talked about dropping the information system in the organization terms, but we're also going to try over time, maybe this will be saved for revision six, is to start to really move those controls to clear outcome-based controls where we're not concerned as much about the details of how you get there as much as what the outcome is that we would like to achieve. Well, privacy and security, I don't think anybody uh, today who, you know, buys one of these IoT devices, you know, a lot of your personally identifiable information is moving to places that you never anticipated. It could go into those baby monitors. It could go into almost anything. And again, uh, we just have to recognize the fact that technology is moving us to these new places. And we have to be prepared to deploy the appropriate security and privacy controls into those environments. If we don't do that, we'll continue to see the cyber attacks, the loss of intellectual property, potentially the loss of our capabilities, critical capabilities, and the ultimate price to pay for not having good privacy and security is you can't take advantage of the great innovative technologies that our, our great industry partners are producing for us. That technology is only as good as, as we can make it as far as how, we, how far and how much we trust it. And that's why security and privacy controls are really critical to the future. Integrating the C-suite and making the C-suite um, everything that they have in their vision for the organization, from the risk tolerance to their strategy on how to manage both cybersecurity and privacy risk, we have to do a better job of preparing our system owners to execute the RMF. This is a big deal when it comes to doing things that are more cost effective, more efficient, and, and you know, none of us have unlimited budgets today, but yet we have a lot of pressure on every senior leader to make sure that information is well protected, capabilities can operate even under stress, under the, the face of ongoing sophisticated cyber attacks. So having a clear vision at the enterprise level and being able to communicate that through our organizational prep step in RMF version 2.0, that's critical to making sure that every system owner 
and every common control provider understands the vision for the organization and what their guardrails look like. How far can they go in catering? What can they do on their own and still make sure they're satisfying uh, the mission and the vision of the organization? Obviously, in Rev 5, on the control side, you're going to see the addition of new controls. Uh, the catalog is going to get bigger because every time you see a new control, that means one of two things. Either we've had a cyber attack that we now we, we didn't have a control to stop, or, and we now do have that control, or we anticipate that, that a certain threat may materialize over time, and we want to make sure that you're well prepared to deploy a control in advance to make sure you don't get hit. So the fact that the control catalog is moving from 800 to the 900 range, always remember that you can pick whatever controls that you need to be effective. That may be a whole lot less than 800 or 900, but yet there are organizations out there that are very diverse, that have different missions, different operating environments, different technologies, and we have to produce a control set that's broad enough and deep enough to handle every type of customer requirement. And again, we have lots and lots of standards and guidelines on our website. We encourage all of you to go there, and if you're not required to use them because you're not part of the federal government or part of our contracting uh, partners, uh, just go out there and take a look at the best practices and take whatever you need to help you be more successful. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to, um, to the folks at Tripwire, and thank you very much for uh, letting us be a part of this great webinar today. Great, and uh, thank you, Ron. And if you have any other questions for uh, Ron, uh, open up that Q&A widget and uh, put, them in, put them in now. Uh, we have a couple minutes to, uh, to answer questions. For, um, I see many customers uh, on the webinar of Tripwire already, and so I, uh, just to give you a little bit of background uh, and guidance on where you can find some more information, we have a, a lot of different resources available. If you're a federal agency or an SI working with agencies uh, and are looking at how you're already taking advantage of Tripwire solutions to provide the integrity monitoring, configuration auditing, or assist you with the assessments for FISMA compliance or 800-53 um, monitoring. We have uh, documents that can help you with that mapping. Um, we can have some solution briefs that can help describe what are the different areas Tripwire can particularly assist you with, uh, and we can share some information on how our existing customers are using our product successfully around those areas of secure configuration auditing, configuration assessment, and helping to provide the compliance documentation and continuous monitoring uh, across these standards and these guidance areas. For our uh, contractors and suppliers of the federal government and those who are um, carefully looking at how you're going to comply with 800-171 and the FAR and DFAR. Um, we have some solution briefs and information that we can provide you around how we're helping uh, other uh, suppliers uh, uh, comply with those standards and those requirements today. Uh, and then in the uh, commercial sector, um, I, I'm talking to a lot of chief information security officers, uh, a lot of organizations that are adopting the cybersecurity framework or adopting uh, 800-53 for their internal standards, even though they may not be uh, strictly required to do that by the federal government. Just because NIST has produced some great guidance, it would be uh, hard, if not impossible, for most uh, private organizations to replicate all of the years of hard work and effort that have gone into building these standards and uh, are just looking to take advantage of that. Uh, you can find more information about all of this on Tripwire's website and uh, under the compliance solutions area of the website, and uh, we'd be happy to, to share more details of that with anyone who'd like to follow up. With that, I, I do want to leave a few minutes for questions. We have a number of questions that have come in uh, over the course of the webinar. Uh, and so, uh, Ron, let me hit you with a few uh, quick tactical questions first uh, okay. that came up. One, uh, is the DOD RMF uh, tag represented on the NIST working group for 800-53R5? Yes, uh, we have the joint task force that came about in 2009, and that uh, joint task force includes NIST, representing the civil side of government. It includes the intelligence community, the Office of Director of National Intelligence, and it includes the Defense Department. So they are actively involved in working with us on uh, adjudicating the comments. When the comments come in on Rev 5, for example, we will have a working group of representatives from all those communities, and they're going to go through um, with their own comments as well, and they're going to help us adjudicate every comment. So the answer is yes. 
great. Here's a uh, here's a quiz to test our own knowledge. Uh, if my system is currently categorized uh, C L I L A L with privacy overlay, can I expect that categorization to change under R5? Well, the uh, I think what the call, what the uh, commenter is referring to is that we have our categorization is deals with three different objectives: uh, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And we, of course, we have three different. Uh, categories that you can assign, low, moderate, or high impact. And again, Rev 5, it does not dictate the categorization decisions. We, we know that there's great diversity out there, not only in the public sector, but the private sector. And that's why organizations who implement the RMF and are using the control catalog, they get to make their own decisions on categorization. Now, it is true that some federal agencies are going to dictate from the top level C-suite on down. You may not have as much latitude to categorize as you would like, but um, the, the Rev 5 is not going to dictate any particular changes in that area. Now, with regard to privacy overlay, we, we are using a new term. Overlay is still going to be the, uh, a term that we can use, but we're talking about what we call predefined baselines now. There is, in, in the 837 Rev 2, you're going to see the term predefined baseline used in the organizational prep step. And what it really means is that when you go out and look at the three baselines, this would apply to the baselines that are in 853, or there are, uh, there are baselines also in the CNSS instruction 1253 that are used for national security systems. But there are, we, we're finding out now that there is a greater need to develop customized baselines based upon uh, possibly very narrow uh, types of technologies or missions that certain federal agencies may carry out. And I'll use an example. My colleagues from the Defense Department, they may, for example, have the need to develop these pre-tailored baselines for different classes of weapon systems where most of the standard baseline controls may not be required for that class of weapon system. But yet you'd like to have those predefined baselines ready to go so you could push those out to every one of your program managers or every, any one of your uh, folks in, in any of the DOD um, entities that could use that guidance and not have to go through that process over and over again you know, by themselves. So uh, we've got a lot of those kind of innovations coming out in, in 837 Rev 2. Great. Um, another question here. Um, can you speak to how the changes um, here will impact the FAR, DFAR, or any of the procurement doctrine for the IC community? It's a great question. None of the, the 853 Rev 5 and 837 Rev 2, neither one of those publications are pointed to or referenced in the DFAR or the FAR at this point. Now, what is in the DFAR is the referencing the 800-171 document. So the 800-171 is kind of a customized version. It's the moderate baseline of security controls coming out of 853 and FIPS 200 requirements that have been pared down. We, we basically did a pre-tailored baseline, and that tailoring is described in the publication 800 That is part of the DFAR now, and I know that all of our DOD uh, entities and all of the contracting, the, the defense industrial-based contractors and subcontractors are working against that upcoming deadline at the end of December. There is ongoing work to make the 171 part of the federal acquisition regulation. Our colleagues at the National Archives and Records Administration are working on that FAR draft as we speak. I don't know have the actual schedule of that, but eventually that 171 will be part of that world as well. So it is coming, and uh, the good news is that the 171 requirements, they really do represent best practices. Sometimes those requirements may be a heavy lift for some organizations that are not doing, for example, two-factor authentication. But when, when you look at the, the tailoring we did, uh, we tried to make those requirements as tight as we possibly could to protect controlled unclass information when it's moving from federal space over to the non-federal space. Great. Uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of questions about the draft. Um, I'll put them all together, which is, uh, is there a red line version available? Is there an XML version available? Uh, and do you have a, a target go live date for the final version? Or yes, I'll version? address there is no Excel version yet. There will be. There, we put those uh, Excel versions out at, when, when the document goes final. The, uh, there is a red line markup. We didn't do a markup for the entire 500 pages. We, 
we know that that's a lot of markup. So we, we did a markup for all of the control language. So any, any security or privacy control that's changed, the control language, you'll find a markup on our website. Right below the 853 Rev 5, the full draft, you will see markups for two things. There's the markup for the control language, and then there's a markup for the baselines. A lot of our customers are concerned what controls were added to the baselines, which controls were taken out of baselines. That's in the second markup on our website. The uh, publication schedule, you can, we have a 30-day public comment period. Some of you may be wondering why the, the public comment period is so short is because we're working based on the schedules that are coming out of the White House. There's the modernization effort coming out of the American Technology Council, the Office of American Innovation, and they're pushing really hard to get some of these innovations out and get security involved in the modernization process. So we're trying to track with that, uh, that schedule. So you're going to see the public comment period close for the initial draft after 30 days, mid-September. And then we hope to have a final draft out very quickly during the month of October. And we'll get final comments in at that time. And then we have a, a pu final publication date as of today is scheduled for December the 29th. Uh, for the 837, depending on our privacy project that we're working on now, that may be a little bit delayed from September the 5th. But it should be out sometime in September. Uh, there will be a, f a final draft of the RMF version 2.0 in November, and then we hope to publish the final 837 um, on or about January the 9th, 2018. Great. I think we have time for one more question. So um, I got a couple questions about uh, ICS controls. Uh, will you see ICS control overlays be emphasized uh, any more uh, than in the current versions? Um, and then a related question, uh, will there be any customized baselines um, for uh, ICS uh, controls or any parallels to that uh, in the uh, spacecraft monitoring space? Yes, I, uh, and by ICS, I'm assuming if it, for those who are the industrial control systems, process control systems, you know, we started out uh, in the original version of uh, 53 back in 2005. That was our first effort to look at all those controls that go under tr traditional information systems and see how they work in the industrial process control world. We did a lot of research and analysis on that. Those controls were in our appendix in 53 for a long time, but then they went out of our 853 document into our 882 document, which is the document that focuses specifically on ICS security. Uh, I think that's going to be the model of the future. We're not going to be putting specific overlays in 853. We want to give you a just a raw set of controls that can be used in any type of environment, with any technology, with any mission space. And I would encourage, you're going to see an 853, 37 Rev 2 in the organizational preparation step, you're going to see we're encouraging organizations to develop pre-tailored baselines. Now, an overlay or a pre-tailored baseline can be used in a specific organization. You could, you could say, this is the controls that I want to push out to every one of my systems in these areas within my organization, or OMB could come out and say, we are going to make this overlay pre-tailored baseline mandatory. Uh, where this is, might happen is in the high-value asset. We're working with Department of Homeland Security on an overlay for high-value assets. DHS is going to identify all those assets with our federal agencies, and then this overlay will be a technical specification on what controls we need to deploy whenever you've got a high-value asset. And there could be a policy component. It could be a binding operational directive out of DHS. It could be an OMB policy that mandates the use of that overlay. So that's, that's how we can use overlays in a more directed or mandatory focus, but they can also be used on a voluntary basis for anything you want to build, whether it's mobile, cloud, FedRAMP is an example of an overlay for cloud computing. And so really the sky's the limit. Once you have that great parts bin of controls for privacy and security, our job then is to help our customers build the most effective overlays and pre-tailored baselines that really talk to their specific missions, environments of operation, and technologies that they might have, or, or the threat space they might be operating in. That's another big consideration. Excellent. Well, I think we're about out of time for questions. So with that, let me turn it back over to Kate Carson. All right. Thanks, David. Uh, I would like to thank our featured presenter today, Dr. Don Ra uh, Ron Ross. Sorry about that, Ron. 
thank you so much, Dr. Ross, for sharing your expertise with us today. Uh, we know how busy you are and how, how busy you've been lately, and we feel fortunate that we've gotten to have you on our webcast today. And a big thanks to you as well, David. Thank you. Um, and thanks to our audience today for joining us today. As I mentioned before, we'll be sending out the link to the on-demand version of this webcast, as well as a link to the slide deck. We hope that you'll join us for future webcasts and virtual events, and you can check out our schedule at tripwire.com. So thank you, and have a great day.